Thank you all very much, and I think this is a day where we need more reflection than usual. Uh, I was going to say there's really no bad time ever to hear from Naomi Klein. She always provokes us and prods us and enlightens us, uh, but right now, especially today, given events of today, but even this week, even this month, this year, um, is I think by many, many measures a pretty bad time. Um, and I think that means it's an especially good time uh, to hear from Naomi Klein. At this moment, the defense of our democratic values, always critical, has suddenly taken on greater urgency. Existential threats to our democracy and our planet continue to accumulate and multiply to extreme and potentially catastrophic levels. And so we need and we search for at moments like this guides and guideposts to inspire us to resist and insist and persist and move forward with energy and resolve. And so it is for all of these reasons and more that we're, we're very grateful to Naomi for being with us tonight to talk about her new book. It's called No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. It's her fourth book, well, fourth and a half because she reminded me that she has a, 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 a collection uh, book also. Um, a very welcome addition to her award-winning journalism, her opinion writing, her filmmaking. Many of you know that she writes for The Intercept and The Nation. She's a board member of 350.org and, and continues to advocate for social and economic justice, human rights, and a healthier planet, all of which are, of course, connected. Few writers and commentators can offer the holistic view of the challenges we face and the strategies and tactics we need to solve them as she does. And in this new book, Naomi weaves together many of the arguments she's made in her previous work and makes a compelling case for how and why we ended up with the political re reality show and bra branding extravaganza known as the presidency of Donald Trump. We're delighted that Naomi will be in conversation tonight with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, whose victory last year was a bright spot in the 2016 election. <laughs> Uh, Congresswoman Jayapal was, uh, as many of you I think know, elected to represent Washington's seventh district on a platform of economic opportunity, fairness and equity, and self safe and healthy communities. She's the first Indian American woman in the House of Representatives. She spent the last 20 years working internationally and domestically as a leading national advocate for, for women's rights, immigrant, civil, and human rights. She's worked in a number of industries, both the public and private sectors, and in local and state government, and she was recognized by President Obama in 2013 as a White House champion of change. She's won numerous awards of her work, but I think the way I would sum it up is, she's exactly what the United States Congress needs right this very moment. Um, so please, please join me in uh, thanking them both for being here and welcoming Naomi Klein and Congresswoman Jayapal to Sid Welfare. Um, thank you so much, Lisa, and everybody at Politics and Prose. It's so good to be back with you, um, launching another book faster than it usually takes me to, uh, in between books, <laughs> usually takes me five years. This was five months from beginning to today. Um, I have felt a sense of urgency, <laughs> that's all I can say. And there's some wonderful co-sponsors uh, for this event. You're gonna be hearing from them at the end. Local groups, many languages, One Voice, Future Foundation, One DC, um, are our sponsors this evening, uh, as well as The Intercept and The Nation. Um, and I'm grateful to all of them, as well as my publisher, <clears throat> Haymarket, books. Um, it's very embarrassing that a, a writer like me, um, I've been publishing anti-corporate books. Um, this is the first book that I've published with a true independent radical press, so I'm very excited. <laughs> it, it feels really good um, because this is a book that um, I wrote in the hopes that it might be in some way, uh, uh, in some small way, helpful to these surging social movements, and it's wonderful to be with a publisher who is so committed uh, to these same movements. And those of you who know Haymarket know how true this is. 
And I am so intensely grateful to Congresswoman uh, Jaipal for agreeing to, uh, to, to have an onstage conversation with me tonight. Um, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you, um, she is the only politician in this country who I would <laughs> do a book launch with. And um, I was so proud to endorse her during her campaign and I'm so excited to see her here in her capacity um, as a Congresswoman. So I'm just gonna start with a short reading um, and I am gonna make some assumptions about you that you wanted to be here that, and that um, maybe you understand that we do need change. Um, so I'm going to read to you from the conclusion of the book. I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm not <laughs> going to lay out all the steps uh, that, that, brought, that brought me to, these conclusion, this, to this conclusion. But um, So this will just be a, a short reading. <clears throat> a great many people, myself included, have used the word shock to describe Donald Trump's election and the first months of his presidency, and understandably so. In his first week in office, Trump signed a tsunami of executive orders that had people reeling, madly trying to keep up. Since then, he's never allowed the atmosphere of chaos and crisis to let up. But as I've reflected on the word shock, I've started to question its accuracy. A state of shock is produced when a story is ruptured, a bolt from the blue. But in so many ways, Trump is not a rupture at all, but rather the culmination, the logical endpoint of a great many dangerous stories our culture has been telling for a very long time. That greed is good, that the market rules, that money is what matters in life, that white men are better than the rest, that the natural world is there for us to pillage, that the vulnerable de deserve their fate and the super rich deserve their golden towers, that anything public or commonly held is sinister and not worth protecting, that we are surrounded by danger and should only look after our own, and that there is no alternative to any of this. Given that these stories are the very air we breathe, perhaps in this city most of all, Trump really shouldn't come as a shock. A billionaire president who boasts that he can grab women by the genitals while calling Mexicans rapists and jeering at the disabled is the logical expression of a culture that grants indecent levels of impunity to the ultra-rich, that is consumed with winner-takes-all competition, and that is grounded in dominance-based logic at every level. We should have been expecting him, and indeed, Many of those most directly touched by the underbelly of Western racism and misogyny have been expecting him for a long time. So maybe the emotion beneath what many have been calling shock is really, more accurately, horror. Specifically, the horror of recognition that we feel when we read really effective dystopian literature or watch good dystopian film. All stories of this genre take current trends and follow them to their logical conclusion and then use that conclusion to hold up a mirror and ask, do you like what you see? Do you really want to continue down this road? These nightmare futures are horrifying precisely because they're not shocking, not a break with our underlying stories, but their fulfillment. I've come to believe that we should see America's first nuclear-armed reality TV president in a similar fashion, as dystopian fiction come to life. Trump is a mirror held up not only to the United States, but to the world. If we don't like what we see, and throngs of us clearly do not, then it is clear what we need to do. We have to question not only Trump, but the values and systems that ineluctably produced him. The same values that have been playing out in destroyed safety nets, exploding prison populations, normalized rape culture, surging white supremacy, democracy destroying trade deals, and rising seas. At the same time, perhaps it's okay, healthy even, for us to be just a little bit shocked by Trump. Here's why. 
Those stories that produced him were always contested. There were always other stories, ones that insisted that money is not all that's valuable, that all of our fates are intertwined with one another and with the health of the natural world. The forces Trump represents have always had to suppress those other older and self-evidently true stories so that theirs could dominate against so much intuition and evidence. And the persistence of these other stories should remind us that while Trump is the logical culmination of the current neoliberal system, the current neoliberal system is not the only possible culmination of the human story, which is why part of our work, a key part, is not just resistance, not just saying no. We have to do that, of course, but we also need to fiercely protect, protect some space to dream and plan for a better world. This isn't an indulgence. It's an essential part of how we defeat Trumpism. For me, and this may sound a bit strange, Trump's rise has also prompted a more internal kind of challenge. It has made me determined to kill my inner Trump. How about you? Is there anything just a little bit Trumpish worth examining? Maybe it's the part whose attention span is fractured increasingly into 140 characters and that is prone to confusing followers with friends. Maybe it's the part that's learned to see ourselves as brands in the marketplace rather than as people in communities or the part that sees other people doing similar work, not as potential allies in a struggle that will need all of our talents, but as rival brands competing for scarce market share. Given that Trump's presidency is the culmination of corporate branding's insidious project, perhaps it's time to leave some, if not all of that, behind. Or maybe it's the part that can't resist joining in a mob to shame and attack people with whom we disagree, sometimes using cruel personal slurs with an intensity set to nuclear. Or maybe, just maybe, it's the part that's secretly waiting for a billionaire to ride to the rescue of the Democratic Party, except this one will be kind and generous and concerned about climate change and empowerment for girls. The liberal billionaire savior myth may appear very far from Trump, but the fantasy still equates great wealth with superhero powers, which once again is just a little too close for comfort to his majesty of Mar-a-Lago. If some of these impulses and stories seem hardwired inside us, it's for a very simple reason. Willingly or not, everyone who consumes and produces media swims in the cultural waters of reality TV and personal branding and nonstop attention splintering messages, the same waters that produced the Trump presidency. There are different parts of that fetid swimming pool, to be sure, and some people are in zones with no lifeguards and with way more waterborne diseases than others, but it's still hard to get outside the pool. Recognizing this can help clarify our task. To have a hope of changing the world, we're going to have to be willing to change both the culture and ourselves. And a great many of us are clearly ready for that for a captivating, transformative vision that lays out a plan for tangible improvements in daily life, unafraid of powerful words like redistribution and reparation, maybe even democratic socialism. And perhaps... <laughs> and perhaps we should thank Trump for this newfound ambition and boldness, at least in part. The shamelessness of his corporate coup has done a tremendous amount to make systemic change seem more necessary. Because if titans of American industry can eagerly line up behind this man, and if Wall Street can cheer on news of his plans to let the planet burn and the elderly starve, and if so much of the media can praise his cruise missiles ordered over chocolate cake as presidential, 
Well, then, a great many people are coming to the conclusion that they want no part of a system like that. For decades, elites have been using the power of shock to impose nightmares. Donald Trump thinks he'll be able to do it again and again, that we will be overwhelmed by events and will ultimately scatter, surrender, and let him grab whatever he wants. But crises do not always cause societies to regress and give up. There is also always a second option that faced with a grave common threat, we can choose to come together and make an evolutionary leap. We can choose, as the Reverend William Barber puts it, to be the moral defibrillators of our time and shock the heart of this nation and build a movement of resistance and hope and justice and love. We can, in short, surprise the hell out of ourselves by being united, focused, and determined, by refusing to fall for those tired old shock tactics by refusing to be afraid no matter how much we are tested, and we will be tested. The corporate coup Trump and his billionaire cabinet is trying to pull off is a crisis with global reverberations that could be etched in geologic time. How we respond to this crisis is up to us. So let's choose that second option. Let's leap. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, speaking of shocks and crises, obviously it's on all of our mind that um, for everybody who works on Capitol Hill, this has been a very, very shocking, painful, and traumatic day. And I think we would all benefit from hearing from you first. Well, thank you. And first of all, thank you so much to Politics and Prose. Thanks to all of you for being here. But most of all, thank you to the incredibly inspiring Naomi Klein for everything that you do. <laughs> I have to tell you that when you endorsed me last year for my campaign, we did a massive happy dance around the office. We were really, really thrilled. Um, today has been a very difficult day, and uh, it's good to be here with our family, with our community. Um, you know, I think that we know that things are really difficult in the country right now. The rhetoric, the divisiveness, the hatred that's been out there for some time has revealed itself in violence in many different forms, in, in policies, actually, that are being proposed. But then today, in the shooting at the um, baseball field, baseball practice, and today was a, a day where we actually did do what I think we should do a lot more of, which is come together and recognize that we're all trying to do things that are that we believe in, and we have a lot of passionate disagreements, but violence in any form is wrong, and uh, we just can't accept it. So we are in the midst of a lot of conversations also about how we keep ourselves safe, because um, you know the only reason that the Capitol Police was there is because Steve Scalise was part of leadership and gets a security detail the rest of us don't, and quite honestly, as an organizer, I'm not sure I want it, um, because I want to make sure that we are still accessible, but our thoughts and prayers are with Steve Scalise, with the two Capitol policemen um, who really put themselves right there in the line of fire, and had they not, it would have been much, much worse. And so to all the five that were injured, to their families, and to everyone that was there, um, we're sending a lot of solidarity and, and thoughts. And the baseball game will go on tomorrow. So we'll all be there tomorrow. So you've been prescient. In many ways, you've been predicting this. Um, when you think about your books, No Logo, which was about the rise of corporate super brands, Shock Doctrine, which was about how governments and industries exploit um, natural crises for their own pro-corporate policies and gains. This Changes Everything, which was about the fight between business and the environment. 
And now this book, which I think really in many ways what you're saying is the Trump presidency combines so many of those things that you've written about and talked about for some time. And even though you went to the conclusion with your reading, um, I think the first part of your book, which is about how we got here, is really important because it helps us to figure out how we don't go back there. So tell us a little bit, and you talked about horror in your opening opening reading um, and the stories that produced Donald Trump. You also wrote that Trump is like Frankenstein's monster, a combination of so many different pieces of these bad stories. How did these stories become real? Why did we end up choosing those paths and not the other alternatives that you've put out there? Um, and what did we do to allow them to be so? So it's, I don't think we can understand Trump without understanding the era in which he rose to power, right? I mean, he is so much a product of the neoliberal era, right? He shoots to fame in the 1980s. He actually makes his first major business deal in the 1970s in the midst of um, New York's debt crisis, uh, and and, and uh, some historians see that debt crisis and the way it was exploited by the business community to attack New York's social safety net, which at that point was the most um, ambitious, uh, you know, set of public policies, you know, public transit, healthcare centers, public libraries. I mean, it was really quite an... Um, almost utopian experiment, right? Um, but it was expensive and, you know, it meant higher, higher taxes. And, and um, when, when, and it, you know, it, it, there was overspending and there was a global debt crisis underway, but that shock was in many ways the precursor to what I describe in the shock doctrine. When I wrote that book, actually, some people said that I should have started with New York, not Chile in the 70s, but New York as a municipal example, right? Um, you know, in the midst of that crisis, Trump made his first big real estate deal to buy a hotel in downtown Manhattan, because at that point, he had been, in his, until then, he'd been in his father's shadow working in the outer boroughs. Um, you know, it was more middle-class housing that they were building, not big, shiny towers, right? And he uses the crisis to extract these predatory terms from the city of New York that desperately wanted a buyer for a bankrupt building. They didn't want it to look, sit empty um, and feed this image of New York in disrepair. So Trump used that crisis to basically get a complete tax waiver from the city of New York, which if you add it up amounts to, um, you know, I think it's more than $300 million worth of taxes that the city could have collected. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, and um, uh, I, uh, I, I'm indebted to a great historian named uh, Kim Phillips Fine who wrote a book called Fear City that just came out about the New York's debt crisis. So then come the, comes the 80s, and it's sort of like this era, which was, you know, the, the Reagan era kind of needed a businessman to sort of embody this celebration of, of greed, like the, you know, the, the Wall Street ethos, and Trump... Trump cast himself, really, you know? Uh, and this is the thing, he under, you know, he's always understood the, the power of marketing. Um, and, you know, what I wrote about in No Logo was how in this period, you know, um, it, well, in the 90s, we started to see the emergence of, of these companies that, that ad adopted a new business model. And the business model was, we are no longer in the business of selling things. Um, or, you know, whether that thing is a shoe or, you know, a condo or a, a laptop. We are in the business of selling ideas, of selling brands, and then projecting those brands onto as many surfaces as possible. And that was the shift that I was writing about in No Logo, which had these huge effects. From a cultural perspective, it meant we were experiencing way more aggressive marketing. And just, you know, advertisers wanted to get everywhere. You know, they wanted ads in schools. They wanted, you know, just a way bigger presence in our lives. Um, but they also were breaking the traditional deal that they had with workers, right? So they were saying, well, why should we own our own factories? You know, that, that part of the deal isn't important. The value is in marketing and in design. Um, it will, and so this is the free trade era, which makes it possible to outsource production to this web of contractors and subcontractors. So Trump applied this model to real estate, 
right? Um, you know, people still talk about him as if he's in the business of building buildings. He's not. He's in the business of selling his name to other people who sell buildings, right? His, what he builds is his own brand, and this has been true um, since The Apprentice. He still has a couple of flagship properties like Mar-a-Lago and Trump Tower in New York, but the vast majority of his holdings are these project places that on which he projects his brand and gets paid himself, right? Um, so I, I think this is really important for understanding a few things about what's going on in, you know, in Washington. One is that his relationship with his base is, a, is not the relationship, the traditional relationship of politician and voter constituents who then have some right to hold a, a politician accountable. You know, is, he does not have the same relationship with his base that you have with your constituents, right? Um, he has a relationship of, um, of a brand with its consumers who are projecting their hopes and dreams onto him, you know, and he is encouraging this aspirational identity. Um, the, the real problem we have is that Trump went and designed a completely amoral or immoral brand, right? So like, you know, some of these companies that I wrote about in No Logo, at least they were selling sort of an aspirational identity that had some kind of ethics to it, right? Um, so you could hold them accountable and just be like, you know, you say you're a family-friendly business, but look at how you're producing your products, Disney, you know, whatever. It, but Trump's brand is, um, is basically impunity, right? I mean, if you, his brand is, if you're rich enough, you can do whatever you want. It is power through wealth, right? Um, so you can't catch him out on a corruption scandal. You can't catch him out lying. You can't catch him out treating people like garbage because all of that it fits perfectly with his brand. He, the more he does it, the more he gets away with it, the more he is confirming his impunity and his power via his wealth. So there have to be other ways of eroding that brand. Okay. Um, well, you know, we hope that things do stick, and I will tell you that we just filed an emoluments lawsuit against Donald Trump today. Okay, I'm going to turn the tables again. Um, <laughs> So tell us about this. I mean, what what tell, what 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 do you think is going to happen, and and where do you think he's vulnerable? To, um, tell us about the lawsuit. It was filed yesterday. I'm only going to let you get away with this one or two more times, but this is really about you. So we're going to turn it right back. But I'll just say, 200 lawmakers today, 200 Democrats signed this lawsuit. It started in the Judiciary Committee, where I'm a member of that committee, and every single member of the Judiciary Committee. Um, uh, signed on. And basically what it says is very simple. I mean, who would have thought that emoluments would have been one of the most popular words across the country? So the emoluments clause of the Constitution essentially says that you cannot take foreign gifts from people um, in order to benefit your presidency, right? So it's, it's this very simple concept. We might think of it as bribery, um, but it, it, it came from the original idea that we didn't want to have influences on our president that made his loyalties, his or her loyalties, to some other foreign government. And that the president of the United States should be responsible to the people of the United States. And that the president of the United States should, that's why we ask for the president to disclose his tax returns and to um, make sure that we don't have conflicts of interest. But you talked about his buildings. I want to turn this right back to you. We talk, talked about his buildings and, um, you know, he is in violation of the Constitution with Trump Tower. He has leases from the U.S. government, which he now controls those agencies that are responsible for those leases. So there are um, all kinds of issues here, but one of the things that I was thinking about, this isn't even on my list of questions to ask you, but when you said that you know, it's his brand that he's selling, he did sell also a slightly different brand to working people across the country. That brand was that he cared about workers even though he got Chinese steel to build all his buildings, he was ta he's talking about making America. How do, how do we bring out the conflicts between what he says he is for as the president of the United States and how he won, in part, how he won the election? Because he also won it in part 
by exactly what you're talking about, this other part of the big boss brand. But how do we bring out those contradictions in brand? And you've written a lot about hollow brand. Um, and maybe you want to explain just exactly what you mean by that. And where is the opportunity for us with a brand to damage the brand and perhaps to try to use it in our favor? Yeah, so, I mean, one thing I would just say about the, the emoluments before we move on from there is, you know, this, this book, like, it, it, it's, it, it, I was able to update, you know, just as we were going to press, you know, getting in, for instance, a, an investigation that came out about a factory that worked with one of Ivanka Trump's uh, um, contractors where workers were paid about a dollar an hour, paid 60 hours, 60 um, so we worked 60 hours a week, um, you know, women uh, not, obviously not given maternity leave of any kind. I mean, really chipping away at her brand, which is more vulnerable, right, around, you know, being the voice of, of, of working mothers. But one thing I didn't get in the book because it happened more recently, and I really wish <laughs> that, I, that I could add it, is, you know, in this issue around the benefits that they're getting from foreign governments, I have some stuff in there about about the trademarks, right? The Chinese government, um, uh, hand, and just today, they handed out a, a series of trademarks to Donald Trump that they had previously denied, right? Um, what I have in the book is this amazing timing where um, the Chinese government approved a series of trademarks for Ivanka's brands, lucrative trademarks, and they did it on the same day that the president of China was at Mar-a-Lago, and that night, he's, he's dining and seated right next to Ivanka, okay? Um, and, you know, who, who is in charge of arranging all of the details for that summit, but none other than Jared, right? So we see, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you were a foreign government and you were thinking, well, how do I get in the, the good graces of this, of this president? I mean, I think we all understand the language that he is interested in, and it's the language of money, and everybody sees that. But the... But, but the service that has me most concerned that they appear to be getting from the Chinese government is suppression of whistleblowers because three, three labor watchdogs um, who were in the process of, of blowing the whistle about abusive labor conditions in factories producing for goods, Ivanka branded goods, have been detained by the Chinese government. And the, 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 the labor organization has said that this has never happened in their history. It's not like, oh, they, you know, we think, oh, China, Chinese labor monitors are, must be arrested and detained all the time. That's not true. This is an extraordinary situation. So this is a service that is, appears to be offered, or at least it's worth investigating, that the Chinese government, I'm not saying that they're ordered to do so by Trump, but they don't have to be. Like, obviously, it would be a very helpful service to get rid of the people who are embarrassing the president's daughter um, and, and, and denigrating their brand. So I think that's worth, if I could just, you know, offer my two cents on a, another, emol another emolument, a word that none of us thought we would be saying so well, much. Well, it's true, <laughs> and one of the challenges that there's so many, you know, different places that there are conflicts of interest, um, you know, when the, when the embassies move all of their functions to the Trump Hotel... That is an emolument because yeah. that is a direct way to curry influence. And, you know, when the White House shut down all their telephone lines, we urged everybody to call Mar-a-Lago because that is really the White Best House, idea. right? Because we might as well try to attack that, that yeah. brand. Um, so let's move to corporate takeover. No, th th this question around, around the vulnerability. I mean, because th there is this other brand, right? And that is Make America Great. And, and, and I mean, I think what he did with his campaign is try to use the precise tools and tactics that he learned, you know, in selling his own brand in politics by coming up with this brand and the hat and the slogan, Make America Great, and thought he could be as empty with that as he is with everything else, right? And I don't think that's true. I, I think you're absolutely right. There is a way to hold him accountable for that, for the hopes that he raised in, in the campaign. My concern, and I'm sorry, but I have to ask you this question. I mean, look, what I see is that the redistribution of wealth upwards, okay, from the lower income, middle income, up to the 1% one, the 1 of the 1%, is the connective tissue between everything that the Trump administration and 
the Republican-controlled Congress are doing, whether it is his climate policies, his attacks on regulation. I mean, there's so much going on. Maybe you missed the bit yesterday when Donald Trump threw binders filled with environmental reviews off a desk in some ridiculous, uh, you know, uh, a stunt. Um, but getting rid of those regulations is a huge corporate handout. Getting rid of the estate tax, get, you know, 15% corporate flat tax. His whole infrastructure plan turns out to be a massive privatization plan. Who could have guessed? Um, you know, it's the connective tissue between what he's doing with Social Security, what he's doing with health care, all of it. So my question to you, I'm sorry, but I have questions, is what, I mean, what I'm worried about is, is what does all of the focus on in the impeachment strategy, which is how I read this, you know, all in on Russia. And I mean, I, it has to be investigated. This is not about whether or not it should be investigated. It has to be talked about, but it seems like it's, it's like 90% of what is being talked about by the Democrats and by, on MSNBC. And what I want to know is, well, like that's not what's going to kill Trump's brand. That confirms his brand, if we're looking at it from this perspective, because that's just one team attacking another team. But systematically exposing this lie at the center of the MAGA brand, um, what do you think? No, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, while they are focusing on having us focus on Jeff Sessions and all this other stuff, J James Comey, the Senate is writing the health care bill that is going to strip health care from 23 million Americans across this country, and they hope to pass it at the end of the month, and they hope that we are distracted. And so we have been trying to put out the call, and since you've given me the forum to say, here's the call. We need people to weigh in because they are saying that they might get us, they might pass a bill with 51 votes in the Senate by the end of this month and that they hope to have it on the president's desk to sign by August 1st. So this is a, an emergency because if you look at that, and I refuse to call it a health care bill, you can't call a bill a health care bill when it strips 23 million Americans of health care. We should be moving to Medicare for all. You know that's what I believe in. But it goes to this thing that you write so much about, which is corporate takeover. If you look at the budget, um, if you look at the health care bill, that was a wealth transfer bill. That was cutting Medicaid by $880 billion and transferring a trillion dollars in tax cuts to the wealthiest. If you look at the budget, there's a trillion dollars in tax cuts in the budget, and 50%, Naomi, go to the f top 1%. 75% of those tax cuts go to the top 20%. And how do they do that? They cut Medicaid by another 660 billion. They cut SNAP, Nutritional Assistance uh, Program, for 32, American, 32 million Americans across the country. They cut all of the environmental protect, you know, a third of EPA, um, a third of the State Department, et cetera, et cetera. And, Today, I feel very proud, by the way, that I made Breitbart News for saying that the Trump budget was a corporate, ta was a corporate takeover um, and a benefit only to the wealthy. So that was front, 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 side, front and center. But you talk about the profound, this is a quote from you, the profound emptiness at the heart of the very culture that spawned Donald Trump. And I just want to spend a minute on that because that may be one of the things that has been most stunning to me in my five months in Congress is this complete emptiness of heart, soul, compassion, a budget that redefines compassion and says it's compassionate to cut people off or it's compassionate to somehow help oil companies, you know, raid the, the earth. Um, so tell me a little bit about that profound emptiness what brings us there and what brings us out? Because they're also telling us that we only have 10 minutes left, or oh, five minutes left. So we need to move to hope. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> 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 yeah. but um, tell me a little bit about that because it's we'll a fill powerful the emptiness statement. With hope. <laughs> there we go. We'll fill the, we'll fill the emptiness with hope. But, um, and I know you have some ways to do that with the LEAP project, but uh, I want to start to make that transition to how we fuel ourselves again and that deep 
indigenous knowledge that we have around the world about what really sustains us and what really fuels us. Yeah, and that's, you know, what I was talking about earlier, about the, per the, the hope we should take from the persistence of those other stories that have survived despite the, you know, uh, every attempt to snuff them out um, and, and to paint them as impossible and absurd. And, you know, I must say, I'm t I, you know, I took some hope last week from the results of the British election um, because, you know, I think it showed that even in this age of the corporate takeover of politics and the colonization of politics by the logic of corporate branding, which by the way is a process that was started by Tony Blair in lots of ways when he rebranded the Labour Party in the 1990s, New Labour, right? Um, and, and what I wrote in No Logo is that it, it was now a labor-scented party because it, you know, it no longer, it, it didn't have anything to do with working people, right? Um, and, and, and it really deracinated uh, the, the word logo, labor, turned it into a kind of empty, hollow logo. And that was, we were told, was the future of politics, you know? And Jeremy Corbyn came along and, you know, he was derided as this, you know, throwback and just unelectable. And he's not a very charismatic politician, but people see him as honest, um, in part because he's so darn unslick. Um, and and he won this election on it. He didn't win it, but he 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 he, he came. He gained he gained thirty two seats. He defied all predictions. The Tories lost their majority. Their government is very unstable, um, and becoming more unstable as of today, um, because we have just seen this horrific example of the impacts of just austerity and greed with this horrific fire in London. Um, but, you know, the, the Corbyn campaign led with ideas. They came out with a manifesto that was, you know, was, was not about branding um, was not about coming up with the right slogan. It was about meeting people's needs in a real way, fully funded universal health care, getting rid of tuition fees, um, a, a rapid transition to renewable energy, creating huge numbers of jobs in the process. I mean, you know, I don't think it was a perfect platform, but it was a platform that spoke to people's better selves. It was beautiful the way they produced these videos that starred regular people. You know, Ken Loach, the wonderful um, filmmaker, made these election ads for, 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 for Corbyn that starred nurses and pediatricians, and one, one of them there was a pediatrician who broke down crying, talking about having to um, to place a child in hospital 500 kilometers from his parents because of a shortage of beds, and that moved people. And you, you know, the, 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 this project that I've been involved in called um, the Leap Manifesto. The Leap dot, the Leap the Leap is uh, the organization. And people, if people are interested, they can go to theleap.org. If people in this room are interested, they can talk to Raj over there. Um, but it was an attempt to, to come up with a people's platform, to lead from below, because we were seeing we're, we're in Canada that there wasn't, uh, that, that none of the major political parties that had a chance of winning a federal election had a vision that spoke to the overlapping crises with the urgency that they deserved. So we, the, 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 the principle is, um, we can no longer play my crisis is bigger than your crisis. That logic is over. Um, we cannot say we're going to save the planet and then we'll worry about racial justice and then we'll worry about fighting poverty. Um, we, ne we need punctuated transformation. We need to design uh, um, policies and fight for them that solve multiple problems at once. And we can do it. We can radically bring down fossil fuel emissions in line with what scientists are telling us to do. We can get to 100% renewable energy um, in two to three decades, and we can do it as we fight to make sure that the jobs are unionized, that, that no worker is left behind that loses a job in a high carbon sector. And we can embed racial and economic justice at every stage so that for instance, the indigenous communities, the communities of color that have had their lands ravaged by fossil fuel extraction, have had the dirty fossil fuel projects in their backyards, whose kids have soaring asthma rates, whose communities have cancer clusters, are first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. So we build a fairer economy. Um, 
So that's one example. Um, you know, of, 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 of sort of trying to reclaim some utopian imagination because I think, you know, the reason I called the book No is Not Enough is because I think that, it, you know, yet there has to be resistance, obviously. I mean, this is a corporate takeover. Um, white supremacy is surging. Um, it is playing out uh, uh, on people's bodies in their communities. We have to stand up ev at every turn to this emboldened white supremacist movement. Um, but we also have to, to, I think, save a little space to, to, to articulate the yes, to dream, right? And the vision for Black Lives, which is the policy platform that came out of the movement for Black Lives, anyone who hasn't read it should read it because it's an example of this kind of people's platform. I was at the, um, I was at the People's Summit uh, this past weekend. It was very inspiring uh, to be in this you know, space that was, you know, really built by nurses, you know? Um, so that, that caring uh, principle, caring for one another and also caring for the planet, which is our slogan at The Leap, was really at the center of it. Um, and I think, you, you know, in this country, there's clearly confusion about where the fight is, right? I mean, is, is it within the Democratic Party? Is it outside? Is Bernie gonna run again? Is he not gonna run? I mean, but, and I don't have answers to any of those questions, but I do know that we don't have to wait for those answers before articulating the vision of the world we want. And if we do that, um, then we can hold any politician and any party accountable to it. And there can be that leadership from below. Um, are we out of time? Yeah, let me just say in, in closing, thank you for that amazing, um, just really the amazing writing that you've been doing, speaking and kind of advising and guiding so many people across the world with your words. Um, when you talk about no is not enough, I've been recently saying we can't just be an opposition party, we have to be a proposition party. And we have to... We have to propose our vision of what we want the world to be and not assume that people are gonna to come to us just because they think we're fighting against something. We have to be for something. And that's why I was proud. Bernie and I introduced the free college for all bill, um, $15 minimum wage bill. And I just started with two of my colleagues a climate justice caucus for the first time in Congress. And I want to particularly say thank you to you for your incredible focus on these intersections because what you just spoke about, and I thought um, the very last quote that I had from you, and if I could maybe I'll end this way and say thank you to you because it really needed somebody who was respected, deeply knowledgeable about the climate change movement to talk about climate justice. And you did that, you have been doing that, you have been bringing together racial, gender, economic, and environmental justice, and we're really grateful. So you talked about the ability to envision a world radically different from the present, which has been largely missing, and you, these are your words. In the West, there is little popular memory of any other kind of economic system. There are specific cultures and communities, most notably indigenous communities, that have vigilantly kept alive memories and models about other ways to live, not based on ownership of the land and endless extraction of profit. But most of us who are outside those traditions find ourselves fully within capitalism's matrix. So while we can demand slight improvements to our current conditions, imagining something else entirely is distinctly more difficult. Naomi Klein, thank you so much for helping us imagine a different world and fight for that world. We are so grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. I would really love to invite up the, our co-sponsors for tonight. We're going to hear uh, from Yasmin Zara uh, from Many Languages, One Voice. Uh, Ayana Ford from Future Foundation, Mora Fennelly from 1DC, um, and those are very, very local organizations that are doing uh, much of the work that we're talking about. So it's one thing to hear um, from a writer from out of town and somebody working at the federal level, but if folks can come on up. Yeah, thanks. 
Hello? Is this working? All right. Thank you to everyone who stayed. I appreciate it. Um, thank you to both of you, by the way. Uh, as a young woman, it's always very humbling and amazing to see, um, you know, women doing amazing work out there, um, especially, you know, with the climate that we're living in. All right. So to my work, um, my name is Maura Fennelly. I'm a student at American University, but more importantly, I'm an intern with One DC. So the one stands for Organizing Neighborhood Equity. So if anyone here lives in DC or around DC, they know that uh, gentrification is a massive, massive problem, right? And it's been happening for many, many years, and it's still occurring. So one DC has basically a lot of missions, right? But it's, the main one is making a just city, making an equitable city for all residents, not just the new residents, for all residents in the city. So um, one of our main projects is uh, the Black Worker Center. We're working to raise $1.3 million to um, own a building that we're currently renting in Anacostia um, in Ward 8, which has the highest unemployment rate, so it's really important that we get that money. Um, the second is uh, the right to housing, like I mentioned. Um, gentrification is a huge, huge issue, and um, we really wanna make sure that you know displacement does not just happen like it's an everyday fact, right? It's only inevitable if we say it's inevitable, right? I mean, the changes can be made. We have to come together uh, listen to the voices of the tenants who are truly being affected by this. Uh, make sure that uh, the mayoral administration and the councilmen and women, uh, you know, don't just idly stand by as developers uh, kick people out of their homes. And uh, we also, our, our main uh, platform is called the People's Platform. It's where individuals come together and express their point of views. Um, we have monthly meetings. Uh, it's kind of like in, a, you know, big rooms. All individuals uh, speak their minds and opinions. It's a very horizontal structure, so all walks of life come in. And, you know, they express their grievances, their concerns, or the suggestions, so we can all come together, right? Um, it's all about, you know, we're all individuals. Uh, we all live in the city. But, you know, there are inequalities that do exist, and they're not going to go away, right? If we ignore them, they're just going to keep getting worse. So it's a great organization. And um, Ella Jo Baker, uh, a civil rights leader, is someone who is, like, a main, main heart of our organization that we look up to. And as she says, uh, give people light, and they will find a way. And we truly believe that. So you can guys can check us out online at onedconline.org. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you all saying. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I'm an organizer, a community organizer with many languages, one voice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you to everyone who's stuck around. Um, DC is a colony. We don't have statehood, so we definitely appreciate these spaces where our local voices can be heard. Uh, so many languages, one voice. We are a deep-rooted uh, organization um, that's led by immigrants themselves. Um, and we build the power of DC immigrants, particularly uh, low-income immigrants, poor immigrants. Uh, so I have two minutes, <laughs> and there are a lot of points I want to hit, so I wrote it down. But I want to take my time to talk to you about organizing. Okay, uh, so in an organizing context, it's critical for us to understand the, the main reason we are being outpowered by the right wing um, is because we have moved from a deep-rooted power-building approach to organizing. Um, you'll, you'll see this in like the pre-70s era to what organizers today uh, called mobilizing. So today we see marches and rallies, uh, big and small, uh, but generally without a good long-term power building strategy. Um, it's always the same dedicated activists that show up over and over and over and over again to these spaces. Um, and often they are these um, highly privileged, educated folks. Um, and this is not to say, you know, short-term strategic mobilizing like we saw um, when the Muslim bans dropped, a lot of folks were going out to the airports and putting an end to it, that was wonderful. This is not to say that it's bad, uh, but when mobilizing regularly becomes our strategy, uh, we risk wasting the movement's energy and we risk losing. Um, our power for change lies with ordinary people, with poor people, um, rooted in anti-capitalism. The very few yeah, rooted in cross-struggle. Uh, the very few organizing groups left um, must organize with a power-building strategy 
uh, that includes a growing base of people power, people who have never previously been involved in this work before. Uh, this is the theory of change that we have at Many Languages, One Voice, and we welcome you. We'll be directly outside these doors uh, to come speak to us more about this and more about the campaigns that we run. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you both for your hard work. My name is Ayanna Ford. My gender pronouns are she and hers. I'm the founding executive director of the Future Foundation. I'm also proud to be an eighth generation native Washingtonian from Southeast Washington, DC. So I really appreciate a lot of what the groups had to say that came before and I wanted to take one minute to tell you what we do and another minute to show you how we do it. So at the Future Foundation, we teach social justice advocacy, community organizing, and resource regeneration to future adults between the ages of 13 and 21, most of whom reside east of the Anacostia River. With that being said, we have a number of programs, all of which are drop-in and free, where we provide meals to our youth, we provide transportation to our youth, and we create a future worth fighting for. Tomorrow, thank you. Tomorrow, uh, Stay Woke Radio can be heard. Stay Woke Radio is a part of our Write the World Free program, and your host is Jakaya, who's right here. <laughs> Out of love and respect for how journalism has really helped us all find our politicization and really helped us to often amplify voices and cultures that are not uplifted, I'm very proud of these youths that they've come to hear your story as well as share theirs. We don't get a lot of grant funding, most of our money is individual donors and contracts that I'm able to get because I do do facilitation and I do do strategic and tactical training for organizations, but we're looking to change that narrative. Our entire staff is LGBTQ people of color. Our youth are student leaders. They run their own programs and do their own organizing. And we really want to change this thought process that we need community organizations to come east of the river and tell us what we need when we'd much rather organize with you than have you trying to organize for us. One part of being an organizer, and I said I was gonna to get to how we do it. We use popular education to allow individuals to take their own agency over the issues that continue to hammer us over the head. One day you're dealing with something as it relates to race, the next day it's your sexual orientation or perceived gender identity. And we just need to be able to take it all together and fight it all through. As a consultant many, many years ago at 1DC, I started the People's Platform. As the executive director at the Future Foundation, we now have the people's budget. And we're working to educate folks about how you take every line item in your budget and you make sure that you're speaking for what your needs are and we get away from this hat in hand belief that the money that runs our government doesn't run our lives. And so we wanna talk more with you outside of this space about what it is we do, what it is your needs are, what our needs are, and how together we can create a future worth fighting for. If you don't have the time, we completely understand it, and we invite you to visit us on social media at www.thefuturedc.org. And as we say, support is free, and the future DC needs you and me.